Today I really felt like the Lord pulling us towards the book of Acts. And if you have your Bibles with you today, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 15 and let's pray today. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. God, we thank you for your word. So today, God, we give you this service, God. We ask you to have your way speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in June, I had a chance to travel with my wife. Uh, she had a conference that she had to go to for work, and, uh, and she's like, you want to come? And I'm like, it's free, right? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm there. And so, uh, so she had a conference out in Las Vegas she had to attend to for work, and I was like, hey, I'll go, and, I, and there's some things out there I'd love to go see and explore and do, a lot of sites. And one of those sites I wanted to do is I wanted to take a, a tour of the new Raiders Stadium. Has anybody been there before? Okay. If you ever go out that way, it's amazing. I've never seen a football stadium like this before. And so I spent two hours in that stadium, and it was, it was great. Uh, but one of the things I really wanted to do, something I started to research before I went out there, was this opportunity to jump off a building. And so when I say that, not like, like jump here, I gotta, but it was literally this, this bungee jump that you could do off the building. And uh, as I looked into it more and more, I'm like, I have to do this. This, this, this. They called it a sky jump. And this sky jump was at this hotel, and it's on the 108th floor of the hotel. So the hotel is, you know, when you get up to this part, it's 855 feet off the ground. Has anybody done this? Anybody out there that done that? You have? Oh, I was like, whoa, let's give you a clap, man. But yeah, no. Um, so 855 feet in the air, you know, and you're, you're connected to a cable, and they call it, it's like a, they say a vertical jump, and someone's down below, and they're, cro- they're, they're controlling the cable. And all you got to do is just jump off the ledge. 855 feet. That's all. It's not that bad, right? Well, my wife, Mar, and I made our way down to this hotel and said, okay, hey, we're going to check this out. And I was like, I'm doing this. I, I mean, I was telling our staff, like, hey, I'm, when I got out to Vegas, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump off this building. So we took the elevator up to the top of this building. And when you get up there, you're able to walk around and take in the sight. And so we're up there, and it's amazing. Like, you see all of Vegas. I mean, you see all the good things, the mountains, you know, all the cool things that, like that. You see down the strip. You can see all the hotels and all this. And, and I start to realize, man, I'm higher than most of the hotels here. Right. We're up here. <laughs> and Marn's like, hey, let's go over here to the edge and take our pictures together. I'm like, all right, let's take our picture. But the more and more closer I get to the edge, I'm like, I don't know. I start getting this sense like, should I be doing this? Should I be doing this or not? It's only 855 feet. How bad is it? You know, and so we made our way over to the spot where I needed to sign in to make this jump. And right there, they have this spot where you can stand and look straight down. And... Catch me, brother, if I fall. So, like, like I, right now, I'm already getting nervous just standing here, like, looking down. You look straight down, and I'm standing there, and you're, like, leaning this way. And I, and I just did this. Nope. <laughs> Not going to do it. Not going to do this jump. And Marn's like, are you seriously, you're not going to do it? We made our way all the way up here. Like, she's egging me on, like, are you going to do this or not? I'm like, no, I'm not doing this jump. And my knees are shaking. My hands are shaking. I'm trying to talk to her. And I finally said, let's go. We got to get down. We got to get off this building. We got to get down the elevator. So we make our way down the elevator, and we hit that ground. And I started to think, man, I'm sure glad I'm on ground right now. So glad I didn't do that. What was I thinking? Then I started to think, you know what? I could have done that jump. I could have done that jump if somebody was here with me and said, hey, I'd jump with you. I would have done it then. And I even told Marla, you know, I would have done that jump if somebody would have did it with me. And it made me start to think, man, about dynamic duels. Dynamic duels do great things together. They're willing to take a leap together. 
And over the years, there's been some famous dynamic duels in, 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 the, in our history. And I got some pictures of some here. Let's go ahead and take a look at this first one right here. Our first one, SpongeBob and Patrick. Come on, some of you are sitting here today. You grew up watching SpongeBob, SpongeBob and Patrick. You know what they accomplished under the sea. They had things. Number two, this is my favorite one right here, Chewie and Han Solo. Yes, come on. When I was growing up, I wanted a friend like Chewie. Chewie, when he walks in a room with that, all that fur flying, he demands respect. He has it. People are like, look at me. I'm Chewie. There it is. So Chewie and Han Solo. Number three is this, Forrest Gump and Bubba. Come on. Come on. They accomplish a lot of things. I know some of you guys right now are thinking about shrimp right now. You're like, after, after this service, we're going to go get some shrimp. The next one right here, number four, is Batman and Robin. This famous, everybody knows Batman and Robin, all the things that they accomplished together, the people they took on. And the last one this is a new one here. Maybe you guys know this, Mario and Luigi. So maybe you parents have already seen the movie. But Dynamic Duels had a special, these, five, these Dynamic Duels had a special relationship. They trusted each other. They had each other's back. And today I want to look at the Bible of a famous dynamic duel. These two guys had a special relationship. And as we look at the Bible, we see it's full of relationships. God created us to have relationships with one another. And today I hope the relationship we will look at will show, let us see how God intends us to be with others. There are many relationships in our lives. And through different seasons and different times, God will allow relationships to flow in and out of our lives. Why? First of all, God wants us to grow. God wants us to become the man and the woman of God that he's called us to be. But God will work, not just, will not just work in us, but he'll also bring people into our lives. Relationships. Relationships that are going to push you. They're going to strengthen you. They're going to encourage you. They're going to help you be who God has called you to be. The dynamic duel I want to look at today is Paul and Silas. And I really want us to look at the role Silas played in this relationship. The take I want you to see through this relationship is what you need in a friend. Everyone needs a friend. Let me say that again. Everyone needs a friend. Sometimes we talk ourselves out of that. We don't need any friends. But every one of us needs a friend. See, a friend will be there for every season of your life. We got people that come into our lives, and when it's time to party, they're right there. When things are great, they are there. But when we start walking through the difficult times in our life, sometimes those friends disappear. They say, whoa, Man, I'm sorry you're going through that difficult time. That's way too much for me to handle. So I, I got my own things right now. I, 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 can't, I can't be around you. I can't, I can't be the friend you need me to be. Sure. Every one of us will face storms in our life. And every one of us needs a Silas. Today I want to look at four different qualities of a Silas. And before we get to that point, I want to give, give you a little background on Silas. In Acts chapter 15, you will see the church leaders were at the council at Jerusalem, and they were to consider whether or not the Gentile converts were to the church should be required to obey the law of Moses. And so when they made this decision, they said, okay, we got this decision now. We need some guys to go out and let the church know about this. So Paul and Barnabas, we want you to go and tell people, the church, about this, but we're also going to give you two, two other people to go with you on this, this little trip, and they're going to help you. They're going to travel with you. And the, the, the church chose these two men. They chose Judas, and they chose Silas. And so Silas was a leader in the Jerusalem church. So during this journey, as they head out to go give this news, again, of what the, the, uh, the council in Jerusalem decided to do, Paul gets to know Silas. On this trip, he gets to know Silas. He gets to know how he thinks. He gets to know how, what makes him tick. He gets to know him in a, in, a, in a really good way. So they get done with this journey, and they come back, 
And from this journey, Paul and, uh, Paul and Barnabas are sitting there like, okay, what's next? What do we do next? And Paul's like, hey, I got a great idea. We need to go back to all the believers from our first missionary church uh, journey that we did and visit them and see how they're doing. But Paul and Barnabas had a little problem take place here. Barnabas was like, hey, I'm willing to do that. Let's do that. Let's go out and, and, and do that part of it. But Paul and Barnabas have a disagreement because Barnabas wants to bring a guy named John Mark. And Paul didn't want John Mark to come on this journey. Some things happened in the past. He's like, hey, I just can't trust that dude anymore. I don't want him to be on this journey. So this disagreement caused him to split and go into a different direction. When I look at that and look back, all the way back in that time, we see there's some drama with some friends. How many of you ever have drama with your friends? Come on. Drama with your friends, and it's taking place all the way back here. And this is where I want us to stop and look today. So Acts chapter 15, verse 40. Paul chose Silas, and as he left the believers and trusted him to the Lord's gracious care. So the first thing I want you to see today is this, that Silas will go with you on an adventure. Now, we all have friends. We love our friends. But we also have some friends that we, we know that there's no way they're going to go on any adventure with us. You know what I'm talking about. They're faithful. They're steady. They're true. But they just get stuck in the rut of life. They won't do anything that breaks their schedule or their routine. Don't ask me to do anything exciting. Don't ask me to do anything out of the ordinary. I have my way. And we have friends like that. They're our friends. We love them. Then you have the other friends that you know are full of life. They're full of passion. They're full of energy. They're always ready to go on an adventure with you. Now, today, I want us to understand this. When I talk about adventure, I'm not talking about going to a hotel and be willing to jump off a hotel building. The adventure I want us to really concentrate on what I'm talking about today is this, an adventure with God. I want us to really hone in on that, like, hey, we want to go on an adventure with God. And that's Silas. Silas will go with you on an adventure for God. Silas is a friend that loved going on adventures. And see, Silas put himself in a position to be picked by Paul's second missionary journey. Again, Paul already traveled with him. Paul trusted him, knew him. So when he had, time, when he had to pick somebody to go on his second missionary journey, it was easy for him to pick Silas because he knew him. He says, look, I trust this guy. I want him to be with me. So Paul chose Silas. Paul says, come on. We're going to go on an adventure. And I can only imagine Silas heard the stories, the miracles from Paul's first missionary journey. And he was thinking, man, I want to do that. I can't wait. I want to do that. I want to be a part of that. I want to do something like that. So Paul has this open position on his team, this open slot on his ministry team, and he picks Silas. And off they go. On an adventure. Acts 16, verses 9 through 10. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in the northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Paul has this vision. In this vision, somebody's calling for help. And Paul interpreted this vision as a divine calling to take the gospel to a brand new region, a brand new territory, a place where the gospel has never been shared. And I'm sure Silas was like, this is awesome. We're going on an adventure for God. We're going somewhere, no place where the gospel has been presented before. I get to be a part of this adventure. I get to do this. Can you imagine being able to do that? Being able to go into a place that's never heard the gospel, to go on that adventure and say, look, you get to present the gospel. 
Years ago, I had an opportunity just like that. We went on a missions trip, and we had a team here from Calvary that went to the Philippines. My oldest daughter, Caitlin, went with me on this trip, and at the time, she was just in high school. Uh, Jay Heiss, our middle school pastor, was on that trip as well, and so he's a high school student too, so I got pictures of Jay with no beard, so if you guys ever want to see that, I can give that to you, but, but we went on this trip, and there was many other people from Calvary here on this trip, and our whole goal was to go in and help out at these feeding stations and to help bring food to kids, to help these villages to be able to grow food and have food for kids, help with their education. Towards the end of the trip, our missionary said, hey, we got it somewhere else you want to go? We want to go somewhere else, and we want to go up in the mountains. And we're like, oh, let's go to the mountains. Let's go have some fun. Let's go just do something for God. And they're like, but we're going to go. It's a long ride, and we're going to go up in a, in a truck. We're like, let's go. You know, everybody's like, let's just do it. So the truck pulls up, and then all of us climb in the back of, a, of the bed of the truck. They had bring two trucks for this, and then, then, then bed of the, in the bed of this truck, they put these chairs that you just sit on. They're like, here you go. Let's go. And we're like, let's go. It's hot. It's hot out. We're ready to go. So we make our way up to one of the feeding stations, and they're like, okay, hey, we're going to go one more place. And so as we continue to go up the mountain, we're laughing and having a good old time, and it starts to rain. And it, and it wasn't like it just started to sprinkle a little bit. It's like God opened the floodgates, <laughs> and it's pouring down, raining, pouring down, and the truck is still going. And I'm thinking, for sure, this truck's going to stop. We're going to get out and take cover somewhere, you know, because we're getting wet. But I watched our team just laugh and cut up and think it was so great that we were just getting poured on like that. What we didn't know is that this school we were heading to was the first time they would see any Americans. So we, lo- we stop. They said, okay, you're going to go across these rice fields right here. So grab all your equipment. We're grabbing our equipment And we're walking across the rice fields. We're walking and walking. We get to this village, and the first Americans they see is this guy right here. They're so blessed. (laughs) But then we go. They see us. We have an opportunity to present the gospel. It's the first time these kids and teachers heard the gospel. Over 300 kids in church, can I tell you, at the end when we asked for a salvation call, more than 90% of those kids raised their hand and accepted Christ. It's amazing because we had an opportunity to go on an adventure for God and look what God did. I haven't been back there in years, but I like to think, man, there's kids today now that are adults that are teaching teaching their kids how to love the Lord because we were willing to go on an adventure. It was amazing. And if you're looking for an adventure, if you're looking for an opportunity to share the gospel and you want to have that adventure, make sure when Leah comes to this stage and says, hey, I want to tell you about an opportunity we have to go on a missions trip that you sign up and go on that missions trip. You go and be a part of that. A chance for you to go around the world and present the gospel. And if you say, well, Keith, I don't know, an overseas trip, I don't know if I can do that. That's okay. This week, you can be a part of the adventure as well. This week, you can be the hands and feet of Jesus. This week, you can do something amazing. You can sign up to be part of Serve Week. Serve Week, the opportunity for you to go out in our community, the opportunity for us to knock door to door and say, hey, how can I pray with you? You don't know what God's going to do with that. God's going to give you opportunities to pour into somebody's life. Don't take this week and say, okay, it's a little warm out. I'm just going to sit at home in my AC. Be willing to say, hey, I'm going to take an adventure for God this week, and I'm going to sign up for Serve Week. And that's what Paul and Silas were on. They went on a trip to a brand new area. Some might be thinking, I don't know if I can ever do that. Listen, there's something about having a friend 
that is willing to go with you and walk with you in your calling? Who's willing to support you in the journey? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30 says, How can one man chase a thousand or two put 10,000 to flight? There's a multiplying that's taking place here. There's an increase that happens. It's not that there's one to 1,000 and two to 2,000. That's not how it works. It's one to 1,000, but two can put 10,000 to flight. What does that mean? God is simply saying when you come together, when you come together with a friend who's willing to take an adventure with you, you have the potential to reach more people. And understand this. I'm not saying, hey, you got to keep, you got to, that can only happen on a missions trip. You got to go on a missions trip. It could be one student in this room right now saying, hey, you know what? I need one friend to help me reach my school. I just need one. Why? Because two of us together can put 10,000 in flight. It can be you and your workplace, you and your, your connection in your community or your neighborhood or your relationship with, you, with the parents you have on your kids' sports teams. You just need one friend who says, you want to have an adventure for God? Let's go. Let's see what God can do when we stand together, when we pray for people, when we encourage people or speak life into people, when we share the love of Jesus with people. Come on. We all need a Silas. The next thing I want you to understand about Silas is this. Number two, a Silas will stand with you in faith. A Silas will stand with you in faith. They take this trip to Macedonia, and it's a brand new place as they're ministering and pouring into people's lives. They end up going to a, a city called Philippi, and as they, as they go into Philippi, they start their ministry. They start seeing things happen. They start seeing things changing for God. Then all of a sudden, something crazy takes place. Something crazy happens. Look with me in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 17. One day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had the spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are the servants of the most high God, and they come to tell you how to be saved. This servant girl has this demonic spirit of her. When it, with it, she's able to predict the future. She's able to predict the future for people. People consider this slave girl as a, the demon-inspired words to be from God. So her services for, a for being a fortune teller, she made tons of money for her masters. And Paul and Silas are in this brand new place. And they're here to tell people about Jesus. And she starts shouting, these men are servants of the most high God. And they come to tell you how to be saved. Everywhere they were going, she was following them and shouting, these men, these men. Now what she, say, what she was saying wasn't wrong you got to realize, if you got somebody shouting and screaming at the top of their voice everywhere you go, you're probably not going to get a whole lot accomplished. You're not going to be able to have the conversation or share with somebody because every time you open your mouth, she's shouting, these men. Can you imagine how annoying that would be? And it went on for days. Days. Everywhere, these men, these men. And isn't it interesting that the people in Philippi didn't know who Paul and Silas were, but the demonic spirit knew exactly who they were. The demonic spirit knew Paul and Silas were there to present the gospel, and he didn't want, it, didn't want that to take place. Acts chapter 16, verses eight, verse 18 says, this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon with her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. Paul hit his limit. He couldn't take it anymore. He's like, this is enough of this lady yelling at me. It's been going on for days. So he whips around and commands that spirit to come out, and in a moment she was delivered just like that. She was set free. Think about this. You're trying to do something in life. 
You're trying to do what you believe God has called you to do. And you're getting all this pushback. All this resistance. How many of you have ever been there before? You're like, I'm getting all this pushback. I'm trying to do something for God. I'm trying to do what he's called me to do, but I'm just getting all this pushback. But you, what we see here, Silas is standing there and encouraging, cheering you on, standing in faith with you. I can imagine when this took place, Silas was standing there saying, yes, this is so amazing. We're on an adventure for God. Did you see what just happened? He probably was giving Paul high five saying, man, you told that spirit where to go. We all need a friend like Silas, a friend that will stand with us in faith. Proverbs 20, 17, verse 70 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. We got to get our, ourselves around some people of faith. Let me say that again. We have friends then we have friends of faith. I'm going to tell you, friends, we need to be around all our friends of faith. Be around them because they're going to encourage you. They're going to stand with you. When we're on adventures, when it's time for us to take that step of faith, it's a whole lot easier when we have somebody there with us. Why? Because iron sharpens iron. I make them stronger they make me stronger. The next thing I want you to see about Silas is this. Silas will walk with you into a storm. Paul and Silas are standing there. And I wish I could say this is how the church of Philippi started. But that's not what happened. This that would have been a great story, but that didn't happen just yet. So Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 21 says, Her master's hopes or wealth were now shattered. So they grab Paul and Silas and drag them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shout it to the city officials. They're teaching customs that are illegal for the Romans to practice. So this servant girl is no longer able to make money for her masters. Her masters get mad. They grab them and take them to stand in front of the authorities They yell, they are teaching things that the Romans, that we shouldn't be involved in. While they're shouting this and doing this, they turn the whole crowd against Paul and Silas. Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 24 says, A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them, stripped them, beaten beaten with wooden, then they were beaten with wooden rods. They were served, I can't even speak right now, I'm getting so worked up. And they were thrown into prison, forgive me there. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into an inner dungeon, a dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Things just got crazy here. They just got a demonic spirit to come out. And I can't help again to think they were celebrating, praising God. God, thank you so much. God, thank you. You're so faithful. God, we praise your name. And then in a matter of moments, they're grabbed, beaten with rods, thrown into prison. What a turn of events. Can you imagine? You've been beaten. You're thrown into jail. Things seem to be going well before this. And all of a sudden, you're in a storm. So how do we face a storm? How do we face a storm? Because so many of us will face those storms when they come. How do we face that? I asked myself that question. I was thinking about that question. I came across this article about bison. And I learned this interesting fact about bison. When a snowstorm comes, bison will turn into a snowstorm rather than drifting with the wind because they instinctively know walking into a storm will get them out of the the weather quicker. Their massive heads serve as a type of a snow plow. By swinging their head back and forth, they're able to get out of this storm. Instead of turning their backs to the storm, 
They say, look, we're going to take it head on. I have a picture to even show you what that looks like. Here it is just right here. Here's this storm coming in, hitting them. And they face it head on. They take their head and just turn it back and forth and say, look, here's my storm. I'm going to keep pushing forward. And so many times in our lives, when we're facing the storms in our lives, you know what we do? We turn our backs. We say, look, the storm's hitting me. Everything's hitting me. And I'm just going to turn. I don't want to face it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to be a part of it. But when you're reminded that, you know what? We have to turn and face the storm that we're in. We got to be reminded that the storm that I am, that I'm going to take that step and I'm going to keep moving. I'm not going to let it just keep beating me up. Silas could have turned his back to the storm they were in. He could have said, hold on, time out. I didn't have anything to do with this. I'm traveling with him, but I had no idea he was going to get so upset. I had no idea he was going to turn around and yell at that serving girl. He's the one who said it. I didn't say it. But that's not what Silas does. Silas will walk with you into a storm. As Silas says, it doesn't matter how bad the storm is, I'm with you. No matter what the storm may look like, I'm not leaving you. I don't know what is gum coming tomorrow, but this is what I know. We're in this together. I'm not going anywhere. That's what a Silas does. He says, I don't care how bad your storm is. I don't care how long the storm's going to hit you. I'm not running away from you. I'm standing right here with you. And we're walking through this together. That's what a Silas does. Silas is going to stand next to you and say, I'm with you. That's a Silas. Friends, and I, I got to say this. We all need a Silas. We need a Silas in our life. All of us are going to walk through a season in our life where the storm comes. You might be walking through one right now. And you don't have to walk through it by yourself. That's why it's important to have relationships with people. Paul and Silas now find themselves beating, bloody, bruised, skin is busted open. They're hurting. Their legs are in chains. It's cold. It's damp, dirty. And look what happens here. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 26. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake in the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Here they are in this horrible situation, in this dark, dark season of their life. And they thought, God, we're only doing what you wanted us to do. We're only doing what you want us to do. You called us here. We came to present the gospel for you. Yeah, we cast a demon out. But now we got arrested. We got beaten. Now we're in a cell. And they could have been whining and complaining and moaning and groaning. But in that moment, one of them, I don't know which one, but kind of I want to think it was Silas, leaned over to Paul and said, Paul, I know we've been beaten. <coughs> Excuse me. And I know we've been thrown into jail. I did, I'm going to get choked up, so. Excuse me. I know we've been thrown in jail. But you know what, Paul? We're going to pray. We're going to pray. You know what else, Paul? We need to sing. We need to sing right now. Because we're in a storm. I want to think that Silas leaned over 
and started to sing. And this is what he said. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Then he changed it around and says, this is how we fight our battles. It may look like we're surrounded, but I'm surrounded by him. It may look like we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by him. Paul, I just want to remind you, we're surrounded by him. Or maybe Silas learned, leaned in and started to sing this. I know some of you guys want me to sing, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> he says, I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I might not face a Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh, God, my God, we need you. Oh, God, my God, we need you now. How we need you now, O oh rock, O oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. See, a Silas will go with you on an adventure. A Silas will stand with you in faith. A Silas will walk with you in a storm. The fourth thing we need to see about a Silas is this. A Silas will help you find strength in God. They've been beating. They're in jail. It's dark. And all they need right now, they've been praying and singing, and they say, we just need your strength. Can you see it? Can you understand it? In your storm, you need a Silas. A Silas who's going to start singing. A Silas who's going to start worshiping. A Silas who's going to remind you how faithful your God is. No matter what you're in your storm, he's saying, look, this is how faithful our God is. Stay the course. Don't give up on me. That's what a Silas does. A Silas is going to say, look, let me pray with you right now. Let me help you to keep trusting God right now. A Silas is going to help you stay that course. And every one of us needs a Silas in our life. Every single one of us, we get in this thing sometimes in our life. We say, hey, I don't need anybody. I don't need any friends. That's where you're wrong. We need a Silas in our life to come along and say, look, I'm walking with you. So who's your Silas? Who's the one you know when you're in the middle of a storm, they're right there for you? This morning when we open up the service, we talked a little bit about Keith. And I can tell you this, like I said earlier, Keith, it was a friend of mine. And there's times in my life when I, were going, when I was going through things, I got a text from Keith. I got a note from Keith because he knew what I needed. He was being my Silas. And again, we need a Silas in our life. Today, maybe the more important question is, who are you being a Silas for? Relationships go back and forth. And there are moments in your life you need a Silas to be part of your life. Then there are moments when your friends need you to be a Silas. We should be ready to be a Silas for somebody. Proverbs 17, 70 says, a friend loves at all times, and their brother is born for a time of adversity. So what's holding you back from being a friend? Sometimes we use excuses about why we can't be a friend. I'm too busy. My schedule doesn't allow for it. I'm an introvert. I don't know where to find friends. In church, we say it all the time. The best place for you to find a friend is in a life group. We have life groups for you to be a part of. And I know some of you have had experiences at a life group. You say, hey, I went to that life group, Keith, but no one talked to me. My question is to to you is, did you talk to them? Don't give up on attending a life group because you had one bad experience. There's many more out there. You have to find the right group for you. Because when you find that group, guess what? You're going to find your Silas's in that group. This is the place you can find godly friends. Go be a friend. Go be a Silas. And remember, if you're going to be a Silas, 
You're willing to go on an adventure with somebody. You're willing to stand in faith with somebody. You're willing to walk with somebody into a storm. And you're willing to help somebody find strength in God. Go be a Silas. And God will bless you and bring you a Silas. Today as we close, I want to be a Silas for you. I want to take time and stand here in faith with you and pray with you. So I'm going to ask right now if every eye can be closed and head bowed right now. And with your eyes closed and heads bowed, how many of you can just, by raising your hand, it's just between you and I, can say, you know what, Keith? I'm going through that storm right now. I'm in a storm right now. If you could just raise your hand. I'm in that storm. And I need a Silas to come along and pray with me. Yes. Hands are going up everywhere. Again, if you're here, you just say, look, God, I'm in this storm. I feel like I'm alone right now. I just need a Silas. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you bring people into our lives. And God, today, many of my friends raised their hands and said, I'm in a storm right now. I'm in the middle of it. God, I just want you right now to come along, my friends, right now and remind them they're not walking this storm alone. You're there with them. And God, I just pray that the burdens that they're holding on to, God, that you just take that burden right now and take that away from them. God, let them see as they face this storm that you have a plan for their life, God, that you're going to use them. And this right now, they're just in this season. There's going to be a day they're on the other side of this. So God, we pray for that. God, I pray for the person in this room that right now says, I need a Silas. God, I pray that you allow them to bring people into their life right now, that some of them can be a Silas in their life. God, I pray for the person right in the room, all of us in the room right now, God, allow us as we leave here today to be reminded that we're supposed to be a Silas as well. There's times when we need to be that person just like Silas. So God, we thank you for today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We see in scripture there, they prayed, and we just prayed. We also see in the scripture, what do they do? They sing. They worship their God. And so I think it's very fitting today, before we wrap up, we take some time and worship our God. So I'm gonna ask you just to stand with me with us today. And I'm gonna encourage you, whatever you're going through today, today you just lift your hands and you say, God, here I am today. I'm just gonna praise you today. So join us as we worship today. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy.
today we worship your name. God, we give you praise. We're so thankful, God, for the things you do in our life. And God, again, we just pray for the people that are going through that storm right now, God, that you continue to direct it and guide that right now. God, we pray as we walk out of this place today, God, let us be remembered that we're supposed to be that Silas. Let us be a witness for you today, God. God, we pray this week as we head into Serve Week, God, give us divine opportunities to speak into somebody's life. God, the the, the divine opportunities to bring somebody to you. So again, God, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Calvary, it's so great to worship with you today. Have a great week. Hope to see you at Serve Week.